Hey everybody, I'm Nina Soden, urban fantasy author, author of the Sector C series and the Blood Angel series. And today we have a special guest with me. So I'm gonna be talking to Amanda Ornick. She is or was raised in Southern California on a healthy diet of fantasy and science fiction. She grew up knowing from the time she was very small that she wanted to be an author. She wrote her first story at the age of five and began her first novel at 11, which just blows me away. Uh, while attaining her bachelor's in creative writing from USC, Amanda received the Middleton Fellowship for Excellence in Poetry. Today, she has one published sci-fi novel and has recently begun following her renewed passion for Regency historical romance. Welcome, and thank you so much for doing this interview with me. Oh, yeah, definitely. It's been a long time since we chatted about books. It has been way too long, way too long. So let's start out by talking about your sci-fi. So what is your novel? What is it about? And where can people buy it? Uh, well, Sister of the Circuit is my, it's a cyberpunk science fiction novel. It's set in a dystopic, um, like futuristic uh, California after um, a, a techno virus kind of, killed off most of society and they just kind of rebuilt it the western half of the united states parts of canada and then um you would call it like the baja california section of mexico are all in one country called apotheosis and this is run by the church of technology and they actually worship the internet as their deity okay so the main character is isadore ram she's one of the up and coming nuns in this um, church of technology and she wants to become uh, the elite of the elite, a sister of the circuit. So she, on the, the story opens up with her final exam sort of as she um, proves that she's ready to, to join this elite order and what happens when that goes terribly wrong for her. Awesome. Very cool. Now, what age range would you say this story is? I'd say that this is probably um, uh, when my, my friends were asking me about whether or not their kids could read it. I said that this is probably kind of more like matrix level violence. Okay. So um, it's not the kind of thing that I'd say, hey, eight-year-old, read this. <laughs> but, um, but the themes are more kind of more toward an adult level sort of reader so um i wouldn't necessarily say that the content isn't teen appropriate but the, the teens aren't going to necessarily really connect with this unless they are from southern california and know all the areas because okay. i did turn disneyland into a prison oh that's awesome that's yes. <laughs> really kind of cool okay yeah. So now you have a new found or new revived passion for Regency historical romance. I assume yeah. this is what led to the short story Mary's Song. Yes. Yeah. Um, I spent the last, I think, two years kind of rekindling this um, uh, this love of Jane Austen's world and, and all the books that have been spurred up as a genre, which I didn't really even understand when I started that this was a thing. And it's not just a thing, it's a huge deal. <laughs> so I, I read probably about 150 books, 200 books somewhere, wow. trying to steep myself in a completely different culture. Because when you write science fiction, as you know, you kind of set the tone, you decide yeah. what things are going. But when you're setting in a time period, you have to be accurate to that time period. Yeah. And so I didn't know any of the vernacular at the time. So I was really kind of out of my depth, but I was fascinated and just kind of went where my heart was. And um, now as a result, I kind of stepped into um, just like the short end of the pool, but it wasn't necessarily the easy one because I did what is what they call a variation, which is a fan fiction based on someone else's world. So it's a story, a romance story for one of the minor characters in Pride and Prejudice. Okay. Um, so Elizabeth Bennett's sister gets her own story. And this is the sister that no one likes, not even the author liked her. <laughs> You can, when you read that book, you can tell Mary was like her least favorite person. So 
I always kind of felt a kinship to Mary. I was like, wait a second. She's kind of the oddball. She's like the reader. She's like the scripture nut. Why can't she get a story too? So that's what I ended up doing. And the, the response has been very positive. Any of the reviews that I've read have been from people that are into this. This is a subgenre that is incredibly tight knit. So the fact that I got reviews where they said that it was a good version, a good variation of this thing, I was like, oh, okay, well now I can start writing my own stuff. <laughs> I did the hard thing first. That's really exciting. That is very exciting. So now you're going to branch out, you're going to go away from the fan fiction aspect of it, and you're mm -hmm. going to create your own stories. Yeah, I've started writing um, a, a, uh, a Regency romance series set in my own town um, at the, in, in the early 1900s. Um, and then I got halfway through the planning of that first book and then realized I need to at least write a short story or a something before that so I had to stop my planning and then move over to this other project the, the I don't know if this ever happened to you but this series keeps getting bigger the more that I start planning one book at a time yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great problem to have right right yeah exactly. because as, as writers we never want to run out of material and if mm -hmm. if one story just grows and grows and grows and grows yeah let it be just let it grow <laughs> let it keep going because yeah you know, it, it it's a really exciting problem to have and yeah. i'm i'm in the world building right now of it and that where you have the Google Maps out, and I found something called alltrails.com. If you ever want to set something in a real world environment, yeah. they have walking trails of worldwide areas. So wow. I was able to go to the town that I'm setting this new story in, which is called Brindle in the north of England, and see all the areas. And they're like, walk past this bridge and towards this, so I can name, I can use real names in the area That's awesome. and then there's historical listings of like what homes were built before the like so I make sure that I don't reference a house that wasn't built until 1820 right. or 1900 or something so a lot of that research that normally in the last hundred years people would do themselves they would yeah. go to, and take a trip well we can't do that right now so I'm doing a virtual trip so but that's, that's really, a lot of fun. That's really exciting, and it's and it's completely different than like I mean I do urban fantasy. It's I make shit up. <laughs> <laughs> you do you do the sci-fi, and that's making stuff up. So this, I mean, having historical fiction, you do have to do so much more research when it comes yeah. to that. And how has that changed your writing process? Well, it still it really doesn't change the process, especially for my um my particular science fiction i am rooting it in real world places okay. i'm just shifting time periods and basically doing a what if kind of alternate reality what happened if there was a huge earthquake up in um washington like they threaten all the time yeah. and that shifted the water levels and then all of a sudden irvine was a coastal town you're like okay well what happens then um so she I love that. that a lot of that I, research. Yeah, I do. Um, I have, at least in that particular story, I threw in and then had to throw out, as you know, all kinds of scenes that were based in locations that are there, like a home that was filled with art and antiquities. I had this whole, like, um, I guess they call it a set piece where you, in movies where that you like go to a big place and there's all sorts of action happening, but there is a home in Orange County that was filled with an art collection. I was like, well, wouldn't it be cool if they go in and start stealing art in there? And but that didn't work out. But still, that that level of world building, that part really excites me. Yeah. The, the more that people could say, you know, I could take a walking tour with this book and take snapshots of all the locations in it, the, and then build my own story out of it. That yeah. Kind of thing. That's really cool. That's so exciting to me. So we, we've just jumped into a little bit of your process, but tell me about your process. Obviously, you are a planner. You have to be yes. with something like this. You have to be yeah. able to plan stuff out. So what does that process look like, and where are you in the process of your first story or your first book? Where are you in that process, and when do you think it's going to be published? 
Oh, goodness. That's an interesting question because I don't know the size of that story yet. I'm kind of letting it be the size it needs to be rather than saying it has to be a book because yeah. before I wrote Mary's song, I was like, everything's a novel. Yeah. Short stories are terrifying because you have to have all of it condensed into one bit. You've got to have an entire story arc, character development, all these things. And you're like, how do you do that in only 20 pages? Ah, but once I got to it, I was like, all right, this is not so bad. So this, this next project that I've started and then started the thing before it is it's that level of just kind of letting it be what size it needs to be. And we'll find out because I'm not sure yet. Um, but my first process starts with the snowflake method. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah so starting with the log line, um, just getting a basic care, a study. And then I don't really follow it all that much because once I get going, um, then I sort of transition into um, what they call save the cat writing, which is okay. a screenwriting process mm -hmm. um, that was the, um, actually my editor for my science fiction book back when it was still in that publisher, Ink Shares, had me go through this process. So once I get um, just a basic outline from that, and then a treatment, which is basically just that summary of what the story is going to be about. Then I can go into Excel or I use Google uh, Sheets and lay out where all the, um, the, uh, the scenes will be generally. Kind okay. of, I know I'm going to have this, I know I'm going to have this. A lot of that I used to physically work on on the door behind me in post-it notes, but I realized it's a lot simpler and faster to just do it digitally. Yes, absolutely. Um, and since I, yeah, I'm not really a visual person anyway, so have, having something that I can easily flip around makes it really easy for me. Yeah. So this particular series, um, this uh, uh, Foyton Town series, um, I was at the treatment stage for the first book. Um, and that was like a couple of weeks ago. I was like, okay, I'm going to stop. I'm going to make sure I have the treatment down. I got about a third in. And I went, wait a second. I know the main heroine. I know nothing about her romantic interest. Oh, okay. And I was like, why would he do things? Why would he do this? Why did he do that? I'm... And then um, I was talking with my writing partner, um, my like workshop, writing workshop um, friend. And she has such a strong reaction to this character. And like, it was only like, a small scene intro and she's she's like feeling really antagonistic against this guy and I'm like huh <laughs> she thinks he's the villain I think and so I had to stop and I said you know what he needs his own story I have to figure out who this dude is yeah why does he hate women right now he shouldn't hate women why does he hate women come on Joseph tell me why do you hate women so I went back and I realized there's some really good backstory um, that I was debating whether or not I was going to tell it all. Okay. And I said, well, why don't I write out that story, even if it's just for me? Yeah. And so I started plotting that book, and then it wasn't working. And I said, why is it not working? And I realized he's not the main character of the story. It's a Regency romance. This isn't his romance story. He doesn't get it until the next book. Yeah. So I had to flip it on its head, take a the uh, another character make that the main character and then it fell into pe into place so I am in um, I'm still in probably uh, a mix of writing it out and plotting it at the same time just because these characters I don't really know them yet they're all new and fresh yeah. just kind of letting it happen um, which is weird for someone who likes to pl plot everything out and plan it out so um, that's it, it's been this kind of like weird evolving narrative where I I really need to make sure that the characters speak because in a lot of Regency romance you've got some really flat characters yeah oh he's so pretty oh she's so handsome I'm like <laughs> I'm gonna write on my wall um, get myself a, a poster that says beautiful is meaningless delicious has no meaning because those words that people use, oh, he's so ha that doesn't tell me anything about what that person right. looks like. Yeah. So they have the golden ratio in their face. Yeah, what? Yeah. Does that, what about their personality? Why are yeah. they so interesting? That kind yeah. of thing. So, yeah. No, I completely agree. That's awesome. Yeah. And I love to hear, I mean, you are obviously passionate about this project because yeah. 
Uh, you just have so much to say about it. And how long have you been working on this project alone? Well, let's see. I, lo I published, time is kind of ephemeral right now <laughs> for yeah, whatever COVID reason. Has, well, COVID has done, changed uh -huh. our clocks, I think. Yes, exactly. So I think I published mm -hmm. in June. Okay. Um, Mary song and by then I had already been thinking about this other other project I probably had started that planning before I did Mary song okay. in just its initial skeleton stages because the main character Beatrix um, is someone that I'm really interested in I like who she is but she, it's a complicated past it's it's not necessarily an easy story to write so when I paused and said, you know, let's try Mary's song and let's see if Mary's story is helpful. That was actually good for me to kind of oil the, wheat, the, the gears a little bit. And how long um, did Mary's pull. song take you? Um, let's see. I want to say about three months. Okay. So, wow, that's really actually very yeah, quick. If, that one really fell into place. Mm -hmm. I usually take years to write. Like I was going through my, uh, I recently revised sister of the circuit and published it for myself oh and great. so mm -hmm, so the, it's got a new cover um a main like series title is already there and um newly revised to fix all of the gotchas that i found when i was reading it after it was published that i couldn't get to before oh it's so nice to have it back in self-published land <laughs> yeah i <sighs> I have to say, you know, I, I, you know, all of my stuff is self-published <clears throat> mm -hmm. and I talk to a lot of self-published authors and I talk to some traditional published authors and there's something that has to be said for having your hand in every aspect of the project. Yeah. Self-published author. Mm -hmm. You have complete and utter control over everything. Yeah. Um, not to say that I wouldn't accept a traditionally published, you know, deal if that came my way and then I think a lot of us would but there is something special about self-publishing and, and about knowing that you've touched every aspect of that book right it is it's really um, it it felt a little bit like coming home to me because I've written books in in the past that were self-published and um, although uh, they're not up and published anymore just that process of being able to say okay I'm gonna I'm gonna promote this and it's not gonna be published at ten dollars I can publish it at whatever rate I want to yeah. is really helpful um, uh, sometimes you wonder why publishers do the things they do because I know as a reader I would never buy that book at that price yeah, you know? yeah. Um, an on an unknown science fiction cyberpunk novel mm -mm not happening so um, I like that but the that editing that re-editing process being able to go through and hone it was really fun itself you know yeah. being able to to get back in and, and reintegrate with those characters again that's great so when did uh, sister of the circuit get republished um I put that up a couple of weeks ago so July 31st so I think is when I did it in June, you had your short story come out. And right. In July, you had Sister of the Circuit re come out. Mm -hmm. I love publishing day. I love new release day. What do you do to celebrate your releases? Um, these were pretty stealthy because in the past, I've done like attempted to do like raffles and contests, and I didn't actually get that much. Um, like readership interaction from those. Okay. So in this case, um, I, I've just kind of stepped back from the author promotion side of things, really. Um, I used to have like a Facebook group and such, and I found that there weren't really any people in the group. There were just people that were connected to the group. Yeah. Um, so um, I ended up um, just putting up a, the this like Mary song for instance just kind of letting my friends know that it was there and putting it up um, primarily I'm doing Amazon only the the um, select I guess yeah. it's called Amazon select um, like that. and that seems to be working really well for particularly for for Regency fiction um, 
sister is a little more stealth mode because it's already been out. Yeah. People that bought it already have copies. I mean, I've got 30 copies, so I'm sure people <laughs> have copies. <laughs> um, so it's pretty much all the way out there. So those few people that didn't grab it then, then grabbed a copy now. Um, and then I, I just kind of wanted to do that for myself to be able to say, I can do this. If when I get around to the budget to be able to promote my books, I can do that now. I couldn't do any sort of Amazon, um, I forget what they're called, the ads the that ads. they do. Yeah, mm -hmm. the sponsorships or anything like that. I couldn't do any of that because I didn't have access to the account. Oh. So now I can. Yeah. And um, that makes me feel way better. A lot calmer as a writer. Yeah. So, okay. So speaking of the Amazon ads, the promos, what do you as an indie author find the best marketing strategies to be? I mean, I know that you've stepped away from that author promotion stuff, but yeah. in the past, what have you found works when promoting your books or trying to sell your books or getting those mm -hmm. numbers up? I really enjoy um, the newsletter promotions, okay. the email promotions, um, Fussy Librarian, and um, whew, it's been a while. There were like three <laughs> or four that, that actually gave me pretty good return on my investment um, and got your, your project in the, in, um, uh, under the eyes of people that actually want to read that genre. Okay. And I think that's probably the most important thing when you're promoting your writing to your own friends on socials, they're, yeah. they're not necessarily invested in that. But when someone who is interested in science fiction signs up for a science fiction newsletter, yeah. then you're actually getting the right targeted audience. And so I imagine more, the more complex advertising strategies would also work. But the newsletters are where I really found the most return. All right. And will you be doing that again for these books coming up? Um, for my new ones? Yeah, I think so. Um, now that um, I've gotten some sales turnaround for um, Mary, I can take that and, and use that investment into, um, into small promotions. I can't really do big ones, but, you know, everything's a little tighter around with uh, COVID stuff. So. Yeah. Now, are you, I know in the past, you were able to focus on your writing full-time. You were yes. writing as a job. Are you still working full-time as an author? Yes, I am. I was doing some um, business writing okay. um, for some clients uh, through e Elance became something oh, else. Yeah. Elance became Upwork. Upwork, sorry. Okay. I, yeah, I was an Elance person back in a long time ago. So yeah, through Upwork. And then when that ended in the fall mm -hmm. of 2019, that's kind of when I started re, de, re, uh, um, the, um, what you call it? The, that restarting the process of, of authorship on fiction. I had taken quite a long break about, yeah. Um, a little bit of disillusionment after coming out with your first novel and, and not really getting all that much. But um, yeah. uh, as far as sales were concerned, I had a lot of support, my, yeah. fam my support system. But my support system helped me get the book published because it was basically a Kickstarter book yep. through Inkshares. So they were already kind of worn out by that process. And then two years later, the book comes out and they're like, okay, now we have to get excited again. <laughs> so I think that, I think in that way, I think Ink Shares was not a good play for that, but it, the book never would have gotten written without it, without their interest in it. So it's a catch 22 really. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think that a lot of first time authors have that grandiose idea of what's going to happen once their book yeah. hits the I'm going to be the Martian. Shelf. Yeah. That's right. It's, Woo, I'm going to be picked up. Everybody's going to see it. Everybody's going to love it. I'm going to be on Oprah's top 10. I mean, it's exactly. You know, of course. I've got a bunch of books I've written that have not <laughs> yet hit Oprah's list. I don't understand. Come on, Oprah. You know, or Reese Witherspoon, I think, is the new one that it, she's promoting all the books. Come on, read them. But yeah. Yeah. I mean, come on. 
So I do understand that need to take that little bit of a break and, and regroup before coming back. But we are definitely glad that you have started writing again. Yeah, I, um, I do this all the time. And my husband has gotten to the point where he just rolls his eyes and goes, yeah, okay. I said, I stop writing. I'm not writing anymore. He goes, okay. Yeah. This was like a year before I got the itch again. But it's an itch like you, you saw in my bio. I spent an itch my entire life. I, when they said, you know, in sixth grade, what do you want to be? There, there are two of us that raised our hands for writers. Yeah. And I haven't changed that desire. I just didn't realize until the self-publishing revolution that it was possible. Yeah. You know, think, everyone thought, well, you have to get an agent, you have to do this, and you have to be in the top five, and that is just a small percentage of the industry now. Yeah. And I think that if you really are a writer, if you're an author, I think that there is just something in there that is not satisfied any other way. I know. And, and nor does it just, I mean, the characters just don't stop talking to you because you've mm -mm. decided not to write. Yeah. So eventually I think we all kind of come back to that because it's a passion. And again, yeah. I go back to you talking about this project that you're doing right now. It sounds like a true passion for you. So I'm really excited. It is. It is really, it really um, invigorating to be able to, to hit something on a level where I really enjoy the process again. Yeah. And, and that is, it's got to be, well, my new phrase, new favorite words is autotelic, the idea of doing something for its own sake, okay. that you don't necessarily have to publish this or get it anywhere, like this, the short story for poor Joseph Brindle. Um, it's going to get published mm -hmm. because that's how I work. I can't yeah. not send something out, but I'm doing the story so that I understand him so that he has a better chance of coming through as a real full-fledged individual in his yeah. own story. Yeah. Well, it's important. That's just part of character development. It's important yeah. to do not only for you as the author, but for the readers and for the characters themselves. Right. Because if you don't do the, the full in-depth character development, then nothing you write about that character is going to feel right. Yeah. And when you have complex people, <laughs> you have to find out about them. Yeah. And I'm not that person. I'm not one of those people that necessarily interviews uh, character. I've, I've read um, or encountered writers that they say, well, I'll, I just interview my characters and then I write the story. I said, well, that's fascinating. But for me, I need to know what his backstory is. Right. And so how does he get from this point to this point, which is a, f a fascination for me with everybody. I love to know how does someone from California get to Alaska? How does someone that was raised in Germany get to Alabama. How does this happen? Yeah. So that is also fascinating for um, fictional people as well. Yeah, I, it makes them more real. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. All right, so is there anything else that you're working on? Anything else that you want to share? Any upcoming events that you're doing that you want to share with our No, viewers? we are very, very limited on events right now. I am um, definitely in the writer's room sort of level on things. I'm not really promoting it. I mean, it would be lovely if people that are interested in cyberpunk or Regency romance took, took a look at my books, but um, I also have the audiobook that's out for Sister of the Circuit. So oh, if awesome. people are interested and they have an Audible account, Jill Crenshaw was an amazing, she's an amazing actress and she wrote, uh, read the, the script for me and it couldn't be better. Um, so even though that's the unedited, unabridged version of the book, um, it is really worth a listen if people are, are audible, um, subscribers. Um, Very cool. Yeah. And I will include links to your books in the mm -hmm. description of the video below. So definitely if you have any interest in checking it out, you should totally do that. Um, so I always end these videos with the James Lipton 10 questions from inside the actor's studio. So what I want you to do is answer the questions as quickly as possible. Don't okay. think about them too much. 
Uh, there's nothing intense. There's no trick questions. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. Nothing that, oh my God, I didn't study for this. They're very simple 10 questions. All right. Number one, what is your favorite word? Word? Phenomenon. Ooh, I like that. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Slump. Slump. What turns you on? Um, intelligence. What turns you off? Arrogance. What sound or noise do you love? Wind. What sound or noise do you hate? Um, hmm, this one's uh, chewing. Chewing. <laughs> what is your favorite curse word? Um, uh, arse. What profession, other than your own, other than writing, would you like to try your hand at? Mm, art history. And what profession would you not want to do? Um, probably doctor. Okay. If heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Hallelujah. <laughs> nice. All right. Well, thank you for playing. Um, I am so excited that you could come on here. It has been too long since we have chatted, so I'm going right, to yeah. have you on and do this interview. Everybody else, enjoy your day. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, click like on this video, and share it with your friends. And make sure you check out Amanda's books on Amazon.